Hi, Daniel. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you all. Uh, and hello from California. Uh, it's still a little dark outside, so I've got my lights on here. Um, it's great to be with all of you. And I, I, uh, I wish I could understand everything you've, you've all been uh, sharing. Uh, I, I know I can feel the passion uh, that you all have for uh, leadership, for HR. And I, I just am excited to be part of the conversation. And so I'm going to share some of uh, my experiences and some thoughts I have about where we're going next with HR, uh, with leadership, and with what we're seeing in, in the marketplace. And, uh, and I'll share some thoughts about that. So I'm going to uh, pull up my, my screen here. Um, and what, one of the things as we, uh, you know, look to the future and think about, you know, all of the things we've learned in HR, in, uh, leadership, uh, and, and in what we're trying to do, uh, you know, as it relates to people, it keeps going back to this question of culture, right? And the power of shaping culture and influencing you know what culture is what it can be and and just to break that down you know there's when we look when we look at everything that's happened you know over the past few years there's been a lot of change right and all of us have felt that and this is this may be the first time in a while where everybody uh you know across the world uh, and certainly, you know, here in California, United States, but I know I have friends in India, I have friends in, um, you know, China and Israel and Romania. Uh, and I know that we have all experienced a, a great amount of change and you, we can only imagine what that means for, uh, you know, everybody, uh, and you know, employees, you know, people. Uh, like us who are experiencing, uh, you know, all these forces that are at play, right? We had a pandemic and you know, we shifted to this, uh, you know, working from home. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's in some cases turning into a hybrid, right? So some people are at home, some are at, you know, on, on site. Uh, I just heard some conversation about, you know, you all sharing about, you know, mental health and well being. This is coming to the forefront, right? It was already, we were already facing, uh, you know, say a crisis uh, of mental health before the pandemic. And so, you know, this has just gotten more challenging, right? And we have to ask ourselves, well, what, what is the role, right? What is the role of a leader? What is the role of a company, uh, of HR, right? In influencing these factors and what is the best way to do this? And, you know, there's a lot of great work being done. There are a lot of great programs. There are benefits that we're seeing, you know, for people uh, that are, made, are, you know, being made available. Uh, you know, things like counseling, uh, you know, that are, that are great for that. But there's always a bigger question, right? Which is, how is this showing up at the forefront for leaders? And, you know, now more recently, we have these shifts in the job market, We've got economic concerns. And so there's this question mark, right, about the future. And it's largely unknown, right? What, what happens next? Uh, but I, I want to pose that question you know, for us is what's next, right, for leaders? And what's next for us, right, for HR? Uh, and I can speak from my experience uh, and what I see in, in conversations that I'm having about this i'm excited about the future all, all of those things you know we, we've talked about all the challenges we're facing yes uh they're hard yes you know does it feel like we're climbing up a mountain at times and we're kind of in the valley or we're just kind of scraping on the mountain trying to trying to get to the top well yes and sometimes it even feels like we're in a startup right trying to work through what they call the messy middle right where where change is the hardest. And, you know, some people have said, 
over these past few years, it has been like 10 years of change in one year, right? <clears throat> and maybe that's just the new normal. Maybe change is just here to stay. Um, and, and then the question for us is what do we do about it? And there's an even bigger question here, which is uh, about, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we deal with you know, continuing to grow uh, business while we look at this holistic growth we're talking about that relates to people. And so, you know, the future, uh, as, it re as it relates to leaders and business, is having those goals that are tied to growth, as we've had, but, there ha but it's, it's adding this element of culture and a focus on this cultural shift, or you could say culture shaping, right? And this becomes all the more important for uh, leaders and for people to do and to think about. And this is what people want, right? When you really boil it down and you think about whether it's well-being, whether it's you know how people get treated in onboarding, uh, in the recruiting process, uh, at how they relate to their managers, it is all about culture. And so the core question becomes the, the core questions become this. What do we want people to feel? And how do we, how do we ourselves need to feel, right? About our work, about our lives. Now, it used to be that work and life were pretty separate, right? You could do, you know, your life. Uh, you could you know, kind of take care of things at home. And then you could, you know, get to work. And it was like two different experiences. And that has largely changed, right? These things have, have integrated. And I don't think that's such a bad thing. I mean, I know for myself, one of the things that's happened personally for me is that I, I used to drive a lot. I used to commute uh, in my car to work. And it was about an hour and a half each way through traffic. So about three hours of driving every day. And, you know, I added that up and this, you know, if it's, let's say it's 24 hours of driving, it comes out to about 24 days. So about a month per year of just being in the car. And now that I'm at, I'm working from home and it's, it's all remote, it's on zoom, um, that has changed. And I spent, I get to spend more time with my, my kids. I get to do more exercise or be out in nature. And I, I enjoy that. Um, and the meetings, you know, that I have online, you know, are, um, you know, I'd say they're very similar to what they were before. And so not a lot has changed in that regard. Um, and if I, if I were to ask myself this question, you know, what do I need to feel, right, as an employee, uh, as, you know, someone in a company, you know, well, I need to feel valued. I need to feel like I belong, right? And I, I need to feel that I have a voice, right? I have, I have my own perspective, uh, but I wanna be heard. And we know that, this, that studies and research are, show, are telling us that uh, people increasingly want purpose, right? And especially Generation Y and Generation Z. So those people born, you know, 1980, uh, you know, till now, uh, that are entering the workforce or that are already there, uh, they want purpose more than anything. And, and when we talk about purpose, that's holistic purpose. They want to feel like they are part of something and that they're making, you know, an important, uh, they're doing important work, uh, that changes lives and that can help change the world even. So that gets, <clears throat> that goes to, um, uh, this story I'd like to share about my experience at Apple. And you know, Apple's a company that really strives to uh, help people belong, right? And to give people a feeling that what they do matters. And they create amazing products, right? Like the MacBook or iPhones, uh, Apple Watch, 
and I, I had the, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity, um, to spend time with and to work with, uh, teams that build these products. And it, it was, uh, an opportunity of a lifetime. And I, I, I loved the experience of being at Apple and, you know, um, they have a, a, a motto, a slogan that you're probably familiar with, uh, about it's called think, you know, think different. And this was something that Steve jobs, you know, when he came back to Apple, that was his entire focus was inspiring people with their products so that they could share their voice, right. And they could think different. They could express themselves. And even if they felt like a misfit, uh, that they <clears throat> could feel that they could change the world in some way, in some small way, um, you know, by thinking different. And what we found at Apple was, uh, inside the culture of the company, you know, this was of course what they do, right? They think different and that's good because that's innovation. And when you're innovating, you're creating great products. What we found over time after Steve, Steve passed away, right? As you probably know, uh, he had cancer and Tim Cook, uh, took over at Apple and, um, you know, the focus on the products continued. Uh, the success of the company was, was ongoing, but what we started to find, especially in HR was this challenge that, you know, people were really good at debate. They were really good at, you know, fighting for creating the best products, but there was friction and the friction happened when people, uh, you know, weren't sharing information or they, they were, uh, not collaborating properly. And, you know, in HR, we would get escalations. And so we get involved in these conversations and it was, it was really challenging, right? Because we'd say, well, they have a very strong opinion and, you know, in, in the hardware team, for example, and then in software, they have a really strong opinion and they're kind of fighting. Right. And, uh, you know, some people would say after some of this, well, they're ready to leave. This is too much. Right. And we didn't want that. We want to keep our great talent. And, uh, you know, what we realized was there was something missing and, you know, while met, you know, many of the teams, the teams that worked together very well, we looked at them and we asked ourselves, what is it that they're doing different? And we found that they were working together in a way that we would call uh, different together. And this became our new motto or new slogan, you could say, which was, let's not just think different, let's work different together. Let's partner in different ways. And so we worked with teams and leaders to collaborate by design and to work together in ways that could inspire each other uh, so that whatever products they're building, that the next iteration, they're still going to be working together and strengthening their relationship as a team. And yes, there was some of, a lot of this happening before, but what we wanted to do was amplify that. And so as we did, we had product lines like AirPods. Uh, you're probably familiar with, you know, the, the AirPods and, uh, you know, as they built those products, you know, there was some friction. Uh, there were teams that were face, you know, they, they weren't sharing enough information. And so when we broke down what that was, we realized, Hey, this is an opportunity for these teams to work better together. And so instead of, you know, meeting right before the product is getting finalized, why don't they meet every week? And if they meet every week, these meetings should be about sharing, right. And partnership and building the relationship and what we call brain trust, right? Where it's filled with empathy. And it's all about people working together as a team. And the difference that that made for that team was amazing. So they created AirPods Pro, you know, the next iteration of Apple products, and it was a success. And we saw that happen time and again with the product, uh, product teams. We also worked with retail and other strategy teams, but it was, it's a story that shows the power of working different together 
And as simple as that seems, that means everything in a culture. And so <clears throat> with that, this is uh, you know, some insight about, um, let me pull this up. This is some insight about, uh, if we were to ask ourselves, well, what do we measure, right? Uh, well, every company is measuring their financials, right? They're very good at that. And executives, if you ask them to fire off their net income, they would be able to tell you. What's their growth rate? They'll tell you that, right? But could they tell you what's happening in their culture? Well, maybe not, right? So uh, I, I have a, um, a think tank, uh, a, a, a startup a leadership platform that I've been working on called BraveCore. And where we focus is in this notion of say measuring culture, but building uh, stronger you know, kind of cultural muscles. And as it relates to empathy, right? Which is essentially the heart, right? Brain trust is about the mind and co-creation is really about the future. And these three elements are everything. And um, you know, we started measuring these at VMware, uh, you know, where, where I'm you know, working with, with teams there uh, to amplify how innovative they can be. And we found that as they focus on these, and as, as, as leaders have a plan towards how they can build greater empathy, that they actually do. Right, they actually get better at it in their organization, and uh, you know we we found ways to build questions around empathy into our survey, uh, and that tracks and helps us understand and helps leaders understand. Well, how are people feeling, right? And and it's not just you know NPS, right, <clears throat> um, or so you know net promoter score. Are you going to promote our company? You know, are you going to stay here, you know, one or two years? That's not really, that's not the main question here. The main question is, is, you know, do you feel engaged? Do you feel excited, right? Do you love the work, right? Do you enjoy working with your team? And so these are things that are related to empathy. And so then the focus becomes, how do we build deeper connections? Because that matters, right, in people's lives. And that's how we can be brave in our cultures, Right, uh, and this is true of any company, any company. This, these are the basics of humanity, right? What any person, any human being wants uh, in their lives. And so the next one is around brain trust. <clears throat> and you know, this is what we were talking about earlier. It's cross-functional partnership. It's working together in ways where it's a collective genius, right? It's not just, it's not these silos, right? Companies have gotten very good at these uh, vertical silos, and they haven't really built as much horizontal partnership. And so that's our opportunity in HR to help play that role, to be a catalyzing force, right? To connect dots. There was probably never a better time. Like all those challenges that we're facing um, in the world and in, you know, the companies are facing, that leaders are facing, you know, there is probably no other role better prepared than HR for these challenges. We've been looking at people questions for decades. And so now is really a time when you know, destiny is tapping you on the shoulder and us to do something about it, right? And to influence this. And so this next one is around co-creation, which is really when we think about, hey, connecting, collaborating, the intent is to co-create, right? To build you know, new and better products and services and to do it in a way that is, again, again, this kind of connective tissue, right? That inspires people to feel like they're part of something and they're building something great. And so these are some elements that we've been measuring and we've seen progress on it as we do. Uh, we encourage leaders to set you know, plans for transformation uh, or to amplify these and to shape culture and they're getting better at it. And we've seen marked improvement. And what happens is the business inevitably grows too. Uh, so that's, you know, that, that's where we're focused, uh, you know, with, with, with that. Uh, and, you know, another experience I'll share is tied, that's tied to this, it's tied to the brain trust, 
And, it's, and, it, and it really is related to this question about how will we shape the future as one is, you know, something that we learned when I was at Disney observing Pixar. And, you know, I'm sure you've heard of or seen, you know, some of these Pixar movies, right? Coco, uh, Toy Story, uh, you know, Lightyear, that's coming out now. And, you know, there's something about if you, if you pull back, if you were to pull back the curtain and ask, how did they, how did they create this, um, these amazing movies, uh, you know, in a way that is really, you know, with the technology that was ahead of its time, right? Nobody had created 3D movies like that. And these teams, what they're doing is what we described earlier, which is they're coming together and they call it this brain trust. Uh, and there's a book called Creativity Inc. Uh, that Ed Catmull, uh, who's the founder of Pixar, he worked with Steve Jobs. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Um, he shares how you could do this and how teams can, can build a brain trust. And this relates to uh, Lucasfilm as well. Uh, you know, when, when Lucasfilm was acquired by Disney, uh, you know, the whole franchise of Star Wars was brought in. And, you know, you may have heard of The Mandalorian. Uh, this is a show that, uh, you know, it's, you know, it has the baby Yoda. Uh, he's, very, very, he's a very popular character. Uh, but the same notion is true there. There's a series, there's a group of directors, you know, John Favreau is the leader. They pull together this team of directors and they're creating together rather than just one person, you know, acting like the hero, they're going to do it all themselves um, because that just doesn't work as well. Right. But if you come together in a team and you build something together, you can shape the future as one and it becomes a very beautiful future. And this is true of the entertainment business with movies, with uh, products like with Apple, but it is true of any company, any service, you know, if it's hospital, you know, healthcare industry, uh, industrial, right? If people are building physical goods, manufacturing, it's still true, right? Because we're people and people work better in teams. Uh, and, and that's just really part of the, uh, you know, it's, it's, and it's, and the main difference as we look into and we reach into the future <clears throat> is that we don't wait to co-create, right? Leaders would, uh, and, and this is also a shift, right? For many leaders, right? Many, many leaders who in the past, they have assumed and, and you know, many employees that they need to be the expert, right? They need to have the answers to everything. And so they show up in these meetings and they've got all the answers. And guess what? Uh, people don't feel engaged, right? They don't feel activated. If somebody else has all the answers, they can sit passively there and then they aren't really interested, right? But the question then becomes is, you know, how can we lead with questions, right? How can we not be the experts? How can we be the learners, right? And how can we partner together, you know, to co-create the future? And so this is really what, I see, uh, and I think we have seen really accelerating. Uh, and, you know, even if you talk about questions of well being, right, and purpose, well, this has everything to do with it. Because if people feel connected to their work, to their team, you know, to their leaders, but that they're also their leaders aren't. Uh, people that are just telling them what to do, but the leaders are inspiring them and setting the conditions to shape the culture, right? So people feel they belong and they're building something, right? They're building something that makes meaning and changes people's lives, right? Whether it's a product or a service or whatever it is, um, that it's, it has that, that kind of impact. And that's, that's really what the future is about. And so, you know, if we were to ask ourselves, how do we do this culture shaping work? You know, very, you know, quite simply, and this is a high level overview uh, of these kinds of questions we can ask ourselves. But, you know, empathy, how can we build empathy daily? It's that simple. If you look at Microsoft, for example, 
their CEO, Satya Nadella, uh, you know, he, he, he was promoted to CEO at a time when before him, Steve Ballmer was CEO and Steve Ballmer, uh, was, he didn't, let's just say there wasn't a lot of empathy in his leadership and it started to become a risk for the company, for Microsoft, an existential risk. Uh, and it wasn't just him. It was their culture. It was very competitive. People were fighting a lot and they were not creating or innovating the kind of products that they needed to. And so when Satya became CEO, uh, several years ago, he brought this focus on empathy and integrated it deeply into the culture. And he focused on it and he focused on it with their products. And I had the experience of using Microsoft products before that happened. And then after that happened, and there was a stark difference. I could feel like the products cared more about me. Now, isn't that interesting, right? How can an Excel file or how can a word document or other Microsoft products care about me? Well, all the people that are building those products, they feel cared for by their leaders and it rubs off, right? It starts to impact the products. And then guess what? Well, the financials, it, it impacts the financials because look at Microsoft. They're actually competing now with Apple for being the most valuable company in the world. So they are having a huge amount of success. And so empathy, it doesn't, it's not just a great people strategy. It is pure power for business growth as well as cultural growth and for people. So that's that with brain trust, you know, how will we do deep cross teaming work each week, right? Across teams, how are we going to get people together in the right way? This isn't just about, Hey, get people in a room so we can just, you know, talk. It's how do we focus together to align, to work together as one, right? Like a great team, any sports team you can think of, right? Whether it's in, in soccer or football, as they'd say, uh, or, you know, basketball here in the, you know, and that's in different, you know, a lot of different places. Um, there's a difference between a team that is run by one player, right? <clears throat> um, usually those teams don't win very well. Um, the teams that, that work together uh, and, and play together well are the teams that win. And that's the idea with the brain trust is how do we build this into the culture? Right? How do we find ways to uh, inspire this sense of shared work? Uh, and then that leads to this focus on co-creation, which is we stay in this mode of ideating and building things together. Uh, at Disney, the Imagineers would do this. And, you know, they create amazing things, right? Uh, and they do this, right? So... And, and they'll ask a lot of questions and they'll just continue to be curious. Uh, and, and people enjoy that, right? People want that in their lives. Uh, I want that, right? I want to come to work and I, and I don't, I, I want to feel I'm learning, right? I want to feel like I'm contributing. I want to feel like what I do matters. And I want to feel like my team and the people I work with, we're, 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 we're charting new ground, right? We're, we're, we're finding you know, and exploring new and different ideas uh, that can, you know, change lives and, and, and maybe change the world. And so, <clears throat> so that's, that's all about culture shaping. And, you know, with BraveCore, uh, I'll just end with this, you know, this is our website. Uh, it's, you know, a place you can go to find resources and, you know, some things that are tied to culture and co-creation and how to do more of this. And so I'll end there, um, you know, with, uh, with, with that. Um, and I just encourage you and, and just, and just know, right. That the work you're doing matters and you, uh, have a unique role and, uh, in, in influencing the future, right. And shaping the future culture, uh, of the companies that you work with. And there's no, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, I think there's a reason, you know, this is the first time, honestly, uh, that I've seen, and I've been in a lot of these tech companies 
but it's really the first time I've seen in a holistic way, leaders really thinking about or more open to the question of culture and how they can really influence things for their people. And so I hope that you know, stays the focus for them and that you can be a catalyst, right? That helps ignite the right kind of change and inspires leaders you know, to shape culture and to shape the best cultures, right? The cultures that are going to lead the future and the ones where people want to be, right? And, and just, I'll close with this thought. You know, most companies um, in the past have, you know, they think about profits in terms of, you know, quarters, right? At a time or years, right? It's, it's about maximizing everything, maximizing profit, maximizing money. And we have to have, we've got to, we, the machine has to run, right? We've got to make money. We've got to cut costs. We, these are true, right? But I will tell you the next level for that and we see this in the tech companies, is to think beyond that. And it's thinking, how do we change lives? How do we change the world? And if you were to ask Tim Cook, who runs Apple, uh, he, he was asked this question actually. Well, do you think about, how, how do you think about Apple in 10 years, right? And, and 10 years is further out, right, than a quarter or, or even a year. But his answer was really interesting. He said, I don't think about Apple in 10 years as much as I think about Apple in 100 years or in 1,000 years. We want to be around, right? And that's, that's a culture, right? If you create a culture that becomes a movement that people feel and that they are part of, and they are part of whether they are part of the company or not. So the customers of Apple feel it, right? Now, you don't have to be a household brand to do that either. You can create the conditions of a culture that is inspiring at any time with any company uh, and in any place you're in. And so I challenge you to be brave, right? And ask, you know, how, how, do, you know, how do I need to feel, right, in my work? And how do we want people to feel in the work that they're doing? And then make the change uh, or the changes that will you know, shape the cultures of the future. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll close there with, and I'll open it up for questions. Uh, I guess, uh, Daniel, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. Just, just a second, Chris. We have a few questions. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very inspiring presentation and talk. Um, I, I will put you a question that will challenge you a little bit. I'm very curious about the answer. So, do you hear me? I can hear you. Ah, okay. Uh, the question is like this. So, definitely, uh, you emphasize is very clearly the importance of culture. I am a big fan of that idea. But the question is more practical. Um, it's from your vision, from definitely you have a lot of information and you can foresee some trends uh, in the future. Do you think that in that current world where uh, it's definitely a VUCA world, everything is on fast forward, show me the figures, uh, the, the targets, everybody's crazy, uh, running a little bit more superficial, uh, as in the past, uh, do you think that really the companies uh, will put effort and a priority in uh, developing the culture, in uh, organizational development? And a little bit more detail, I like to, uh, I like ideally to have your uh, answer as a trend from your point of view. First, uh, for, for the multinational, second for the small uh, medium enterprises and it's definitely for me clear that you have uh, give a trend uh, about the tech companies but if you can 
give as well uh, an answer for a bigger uh, part of companies, not only tech, so multinational and small medium enterprise. Personally, I'm a big fan of uh, culture development, but I'm very pessimistic that in that VUCA world on fast forward, anybody will invest or put priority uh, on, on that. But maybe you will give, you, give, me, uh, give us uh, a different perspective. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, thank you. It's a great question. And it's an important one, right? Because we're in a time now, to your point, uh, and again, change happening so fast, right? And the economics are uh, shifting again, right? And, and maybe, and we don't even know the extent of it yet, right? Like we may be in a recession uh, already, uh, and, you know, and how deep that goes or to what extent it, you know, it is, who knows. Um, and so, you know, what is on the mind of leaders right now, right? Well, that's certainly there, right? We see layoffs happening in the news. Um, maybe some of you are experiencing some of that. And I think that's agnostic of industry. Like there are layoffs happening in a lot of places, um, definitely in tech, right? Um, but uh, other places, right? Companies that where, where leaders are, it's pressing on them to say, well, cash flow, right? And they're also seeing, you know, quarters out. So they're saying, hey, we've got to make adjustments, right? Um, now, what, you know, what does that mean for our, our role as HR? Well, you know, like there's a, there's a statement there, the quote that says, you know, never any, never let a crisis go to waste. I think it applies here too, right? Because, but it, it, it mean, it also means let's not take our foot off the gas of culture, right? Because if we do and we hit the brakes and we go with where leaders are going to want to go, you know, where leaders are going to want to go is just sticking with cost cutting, right? And so there's kind of this power struggle right? Between what leaders want, so to speak, and what the employees may want, right? Which if we look back just a year, right? The job market has been pretty great for people generally, uh, you know, speaking kind of globally, uh, you know, people have had opportunities and it's been more employee friendly, right? Where people can choose where they, where they want to be. Now with the economic headwinds now changing, well, the other extreme is going, you know, the other direction. So now leaders and companies could say or act out, well, it's our turn, right? We get to decide where people are and where they aren't. But I don't think, I don't know that that's necessarily true. That may be their assumption, but the reality is, you know, we, there are still a lot of opportunities uh, for people to pursue and the best people, the best talent they always get to choose where they want to be. And so if we want, if you want those people in your organization, well, you've got to create the best cultures. So that's, that's a case for, you know, building that future. You know, what are we seeing as far as trends? Uh, you know, multinationals in general, um, across industries, if I were to, you know, kind of pull together a common thread for what, what we are seeing, it's, it's, probably some of what you've already experienced or heard, uh, you know, there's uh, this element of remote or virtual work that has changed. There's, um, you know, the financial part we're talking about now. And, and that, that depends on each company, right? How that's impacting them, each industry, right? So um, like food services, I mean, it's getting hit hard, right? For example, uh, you know, healthcare, it's been fluctuating. There's a lot of change with all of the demands on you know, regulatory and all these things that have changed there. Uh, you know, but I think if we were to look at, Hey, the core of what is the, de what is the demand on leaders, you know, at this time it's facing, yeah, the realities of business where they have to be smart about allocating resources. And yes, maybe cutting costs. And yet our job as HR is to not, not allow that to be the main focus. And what I mean by that is, okay, 
yes, you've got to run a business in a smart way, you know, but how will you preserve and invest more in people and in culture? Right. Cause I'll tell you this, the companies that are the best cultures and the places where people continue to come back time and again, and the, and they get the best talent are the companies that are willing to invest uh, even in downturns. And I, I, what I mean is invest in people, invest in their people. Now those investments may not be just financial, right? It may be investments of conversations, right? Of appreciation of emotional investments, right? The emotional bank account, they're depositing, you know, conversations and they're depositing experiences, right? Into people's everyday lives where they're saying, where they're showing them, you know, I mean, look at, and you, you mentioned, right, startups too, right? And that's, and if I look at startups, I work with startups, I consult, um, you know, advise with, uh, you know, startups that are in the incubation process, some that are funded, uh, you know, others getting traction, this is across the globe. And, you know, it's the same part is true there. Now they're in a tougher spot because as costs, and as um, market conditions, you know, hit them, it may be cause for, it may be existential where they may be out of business, right, tomorrow. So they have to make some hard calls. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, the beauty of at least many startups that I know is they're trying to do something disruptive, right? They're trying to create something new and different in the market. So they have a higher tolerance maybe for change. And so, you know, but that also offers the opportunity for them to shape culture and to be innovative about how they do that. Honestly, the leaders and organizations that don't do culture well and don't focus on creating the best cultures, they will be the ones that won't be around, right? In the next five, 10 years, they will be obsolete. They'll be the stories like Kodak or, you know, Blackberry that just died off. Right. Or if, or at, at, at best they had incremental growth, right. And they're not a key player in the future. So that that's the business rationale or the argument for why this work and why it matters, you know, and the details of how we do it at each level. Well, I think you'll, you'll find the way to do it. Right. I think they'll, there, there will be your intuition, a combination of your intuition, you know, and the needs, balancing the needs of the business with, let's say the, the, um, the principles of, uh, you know, yeah, building the best cultures. And, and I know that sounds lofty and it sounds aspirational and maybe audacious, but maybe we need more of that. Maybe leaders need more of that because as we do, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we'll, maybe we'll hit the mark or we'll be closer than we were before. It's a great question. Hope I've answered it. Okay, uh, a couple more. <laughs> uh, the first one, how do you connect different departments of a big company and bring them uh, people, I guess, together to co-create? Uh, sometimes they don't even know each other, have different profiles and very different jobs. That's a great question. Yeah, I, um, you know, people are people, right? People want to connect. Uh, and so sometimes, <clears throat> you know, like if you have a, uh, uh, there's a, you know, some, some problem or challenge that you're dealing with, let's say at home, right? Something that, you know, maybe it's with uh, somebody you care about, a relationship you have, and you're frustrated and you're trying to figure out what to do. Well, if you keep thinking about it and you keep analyzing it, you know, you may or may not get there, but what happens if you go out in nature, right? You go for a hike, uh, or a walk and, you know, or, you know, you do something entirely different and then usually an answer starts to come. Right. And so it creates the conditions for change. And I share that as an example, because we've been conditioned, right? And programmed to assume that business is done a certain way, right? 
And we've leaned in, we as in global businesses, companies, how we perceive the management and the science of uh, say leadership or the science of management. We have assumed that it is a certain, it is a certain way that it's very functional oriented and it's very vertical and it's based on expertise and your uh, job description. And I, I will say my view is that we have to question that. And I don't mean we, you know, <laughs> you know, you, people will have their roles, right? They have technical expertise, but they have to start to see that there's a percentage of that that's important. And then there's a percentage of this horizontal work that is also important, you know, to connecting dots. So for example, if you take Thomas Friedman, he wrote the book, The World is Flat. I was in a conference with him 10 years ago. And at that time, somebody asked him, what is, what is the future like? And he said, in the future, people are writing their own job descriptions. And think about that for a minute, right? And how, how, how much, how often are we so set on defining and defining and defining and optimizing what our role is when in reality, there is again, this whole broader sense of team. And if you look at a startup, for example, we can learn things from that, right? What happens in a startup? Well, it's based on a cause or a vision that inspires people, right? And everybody has to wear a lot of different hats, right? So everybody has to do a lot of different things and they have to work together and partner as a team or else it doesn't happen. And so, I think there is something to be learned from that. And if you take some of these tech companies or other companies in other industries that are great at working together and building amazing solutions, well, they do it. And it's like a big, it's like a big, one big giant startup is how the culture feels, right? So if you can get to a place where people feel that it's a big startup in a sense, I know that's a lofty ambition, but if people can feel that way, now, how do you just kind of start that out? Like if you're just trying to get things started is, you know, just start, the, start different conversations, right? Part of it is also changing the nature of meetings, right? Meetings can feel so one directional, agenda driven, right? Hey, I've, I've got the answers. Here's the direction, right? Or, or, or maybe it's just a question session, but what if it were a fluid conversation? Like, like, like a conversation you have with your family. Now, it's gonna be different topics, right? But how do you create these conversations? Instead of traditional meetings, it's a conversation. And then you invite those people together or you, you, you challenge as a catalyst in HR, cause you know, we don't own all this, but you maybe ask these questions about like, hey, what if you have conversations or you include these people in this, in this meeting? And, and, and then what if, you know, it's a conversation about this or that topic? And maybe it's something that starts to unify them, right? Uh, that's, that's one way to get started. And I've seen, I've seen that work really well. Um, it sounds simple, but it's, it, you know, and, and then also with reimagining meetings, another powerful way to do that and to connect dots with people is to focus on questions, the power of questions. So they can send a leading question out before the meeting and it inspires people to be thinking about how they can contribute, right? Rather than an agenda with all these bullet points about what somebody else is going to tell them, right? That's not as interesting or as inspiring as, as questions. Uh, so that's that's one simple way uh, to get started. One more question, Chris, and I think it has a lot to do with the previous one. Uh, do you have any tips for leaders who want to encourage a co-creation approach? Yeah, I mean, I have a few. One is, yeah, that philosophy of leading 
with a question and just the power of that. Uh, that's, that's a simple one. Um, empathy, you know, the things we talked about, uh, you know, em empathy is, it, it seems simple, right? Um, but you know, that, that can be as simple as checking in with people, right? And you know, what I mean by that, it's, it's not just, Hey, set up a meeting, you know, ask them how the work is going. It's in every meeting in a one-on-one -on -one or in a team setting, it's creating some space at the beginning, right? To really check in with somebody and with each other in a team meeting, which is how, how are you doing? How are you really doing? Right. And then also offering support, uh, you know, and, and, and being open to, to wherever that goes. Right. So if somebody does share something personal, it's ensuring that they feel valued, right? That matters to people more than ever before. And so that's, that's a big one. It's simple. It sounds really simple. And, uh, but you know, most leaders have grown up in their careers, not you say not doing that, not necessarily having to focus on that as much, but that is something that people want and it matters for them. Right. And, and it, and they'll decide like they may go to a different company to find that if, you know, if, if they're not receive if they're not getting that. And I'll tell you my experience with the best leaders I've ever had was they always cared about me, right? They always focused on say what I, what I needed. Um, and yeah, of course they also had to get things done and they challenged me, they stretched me, but there was a lot of empathy you know, to, to, uh, how, how they would lead. And, uh, you know, and, and part of that for a leader may also, you know, for, for an, for an HR person, you can give that to them, right? That's a gift you can give, which is you show them if they don't know how to be an empathic leader or what that means, right? If they are just really hard headed or they just don't seem to get it, you can show them empathy in, in the way you, uh, you know, work with them. Now, they'll still have to decide if they want to be that kind of leader. Um, but there is a compelling business case for being an empathic leader. I mean, we could, we could run through that all day. I could show you data about all the companies that do, where the leaders do empathy well, and all those outperform every other company in the market by, by far. And again, it's a simple thing, right? It's just basically bring your heart to work and not, not everything, right? Not everything personal and all that stuff. Don't open it all up, but like just enough to where people feel like you are authentically showing up, right? You're not a synthetic or fake leader. You're being a genuine, real, uh, person who, you know, you have your challenges and yet you're trying to, uh, inspire and to uh you know bring bring the best and inspire the best in others uh and so again that's simple with you know check-ins uh and you know i'll tell you the other thought on that with powerful questions is being empowering people my best one of my best leaders i ever had he would he would regularly ask me the question in, in my one-on-ones he would say um, I, I would present a challenge that I was having, I was facing, right? And he would say, well, what would you do if you were me for a day? If you were in my position for a day, like, how would you deal with this? And that was a question that was empowering because it put me in his shoes. And so then I would share the answer. And then, you know, what he would do was then he would take that answer that I shared and he would start to form or co-create the solution. And he would say to me, well, that sounds pretty good. What you just said, like, why don't we do that? And then maybe he would add to that, but then we're creating something or we're shaping something together. Now for leaders that also requires pulling ego off the table, right. And putting building blocks on the table. So that's the other challenge is, you know, focusing, de-emphasizing ego. And I shared the bravecore.co site, www.bravecore.co. 
there's some resources on there about how to do this, right? We're leaders, if you know, how, how we can let go of ego and focus on this sense of together and the sense of uh, you know, this co-creative future. And so it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but it is simple. And yes, there will be a messy middle of right, being in the trenches and wrestling with, with these challenges, but that's the nature of it, right? And if, and if it weren't a wrestle, well, it wouldn't be worth it. And so it's going to be hard work. You know, just like a startup is, is hard, right, to get, to get it off the ground. Uh, we are in the, I, I think, we're the early innings, right? It's a new beginning uh, for, you know, building the future and building the best cultures. And so I commend to you, you know, to do that and to bring your best, right? Don't, don't be the, uh, you know, the HR person that just wants to blend in, right? Uh, or just wants to, you know, let things happen, uh, or, or let the leaders be right. Let them get their way. And, you know, you don't have to be adversarial with leaders, but you definitely are there to challenge and to inspire and to ignite, right. And to be a catalyst, a catalyzing force, right. Like, like that spark that can start this wildfire, right. In a culture. And so I believe that as someone who can lead that change, you are already, you already have what you need, right? You have what you need to do that. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you again Thank for you. joining us and hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. <laughs>